Matthew chapter 5. This next text, I know last Sunday was a little heavy. It was heavy, but I, one of the things I hope you came away with last Sunday is not so much, yes, we, <laughs> when we look at our, our sinful condition, man, wow, guilty. Amen? We look at those particular things that Jesus said, and, and, and in essence, though, we need to understand that God doesn't reveal our sin to make us, you know, feel like there's no hope. He reveals our sin to show us that we desperately, desperately need Him. We need His grace. We need His mercy. And that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can be declared righteous despite our past. Despite how far or how deep we have found ourselves in sin, no matter what that sin may be, we are in desperate need of Jesus and He has provided for us He's provided for us redemption. And he did all the work for us. And that while all we have to do is to surrender to him, we recognize the fact that once he transforms our minds and our hearts, it doesn't make us perfect because we're still struggling with the flesh. But one thing it does do is that old things will begin to pass away, but all things will become new. Jesus transformed your life for a purpose and he makes you a better person for his glory. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, Jesus goes on and continues this Sermon on the Mount. Again, keep in mind, even though we're hitting text after text every week, this is one sermon. He said all this in one sitting. But here we're dissecting this and we're looking at this. And here's what Jesus said next. He's, in essence, this text, I believe, can be entitled, Can You Be Trusted? Can you be trusted? Are you a trust? worthy kind of person. Jesus points out in verse 33, he says, again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oath to the Lord. But I tell you, I, I want you to underline that phrase. I, I meant to mention this last week, but it's interesting as Jesus continues in this, in this narrative, he says, I know you heard it's been said, but I tell you. That's important. Because what happened among the religious leaders in that day is that they read the law, they read the Torah, but they misinterpreted or misunderstood some of the things in there. And Jesus wants to acknowledge the fact that, hey, you missed something here. He's reiterating, he's reestablishing, and he's interpreting this in a way that they haven't heard before because they got it wrong before. He says, Jesus says, look, but I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it's, it's God's throne, or by the earth because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Neither should you swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Jesus made it perfectly clear how selective we need to be with our words. How selective we need to be. How careful we need to be with our words. In this part of the sermon, Jesus clarifies how to be trustworthy, in other words. Number one in your notes, he says this. In essence, this text is saying this. Do not be careless with your commitments. Do not be careless, careless with your commitments. Now, he explains it in such a way that you read this and say, what is he talking about? But you've got to understand the context. You've got to understand the setting. You've got to understand what Jewish people were practicing in his day. Because the law contains several prohibitions against swearing falsely in the name of God. In fact, in Leviticus 19, Numbers 30, and Deuteronomy 23, it says, be careful not to swear falsely in the name of God. He says, to swear by God's name meant that God was your witness that you were telling the truth. The Jews, though, in this particular time, tried to avoid swearing falsely by by God's name by substituting words 
like heaven or earth or Jerusalem or, or their head in the oath to avoid, because they were trying to avoid using God's name specifically in case they weren't completely honest. Do you hear what I'm saying? What they did and what Jesus is pointing out is that you're using these terms to avoid God's name because you know, you know you're not being completely honest. So Jesus condemns any form of swearing or oaths in an ordinary conversation. He's not talking about in the court of law. He's talking about in an ordinary conversation, he was condemning them for just loosely and flippantly swearing and making oaths. Not only was it hypocritical, but also it was useless to try to avoid swearing by God's name by merely substituting another noun for his name. The terms he used here like to swear by heaven, he says it's to swear by God's throne. To swear by the earth is to swear by his footstool. And to swear by Jerusalem is to swear by the royal capital. And even to swear by, what, by your own head involves God because he's the creator of you. <laughs> so in essence, they were not avoiding using God's name in vain. They were basically trying to, to work around it. But what Jesus was pointing out is that they were trying to substitute God's name for something else. But what they didn't realize, they were still using God's name indirectly. So that's the interpretation of sex, this, this particular text. And it's important for you to understand that because Jesus is trying to, the, the whole gist of this is Jesus is trying to point out the commitments and your words are so important when you're representing the kingdom of God. If anybody should be a people of their word and be committed to their commitments, it's the people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ. Because number two in your notes, I believe this text is simply trying to tell us, do not be careless with your words. Don't be careless with your words. Be careful what you say and what you promise and the commitments you make. You know what's interesting to me? And I, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to throw it out there and then I'm going to keep going. It's amazing to me how so committed people are to their jobs and their education and their extracurricular activities and how so uncommitted they are about the things of God. Okay, I said it and I'm going to move on. Anyway, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. He says, listen, be careful what the words, don't let corrupt talk come out of your mouth because people are listening. People that are not of the faith are going to be loose with their words, but if they know you're professing Jesus, uh, professing Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, they may be loose with their words, but they don't want to see you be loose with yours. You hear what I'm saying? Because what they see is hypocrisy. And you say, well, how, who are they to say that? Because, you know, they don't know Jesus. Yeah, they may not know Jesus, but they know that you're supposed to act like a Jesus follower. Right? So being careful about your words and, and the words that come out of your mouth are so important. He says, use your mouth to build up, Paul says. That it may give grace to those who hear. Because in Galatians 6, 7, you, you know this text, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, he'll also reap. How many of you love to plant a garden? Great. Come help me out. No, I'm kidding. Um, I have a backyard. I, I, I was telling somebody today, I wish I wish I had at least a flat spot somewhere, but my backyard is just, just straight down. And then there's a fence in the next person's yard. So, you know, but I, I, I used to, where I used to live in the country, um, 
previous uh, in North Carolina, I remember uh, having a garden in back, and I remember um, the shade. Uh, it was, we actually had too much shade. So I, I don't know what it was. I could grow a whole lot of squash, but something that needed a lot of sunlight, I wasn't growing very well. I mean, obviously so, because there's way too much shade in during the day in that particular spot. But I tell you, one thing I do know, I'm not an expert in gardening. One thing I knew, though, if you plant a seed, and that seed is a seed from, from a particular vegetable, let's just say squash, I'm going to grow squash. I don't care if I, if I sit there and I take that seed and I put it in there and I say, be a tomato, be a tomato. <laughs> when you grow up, you're going to be a tomato. And I could just take a, a little recording out there and I could let it just play it 24 hours a day, seven. You're a tomato, you're a tomato, you're a tomato, you're a tomato. Let me tell you something. It's going to eventually still be a squash. <laughs> it may be a neurotic dysfunctional squash, but it's still going to be a squash. It's just the way it is, right? You plant words that are loosely used and even borderline destructive. What will you reap? If you sow untruths or partial truths, you'll reap what you sow. You will be deceived yourself and lose all your credibility if you continue to plant seeds that are partial truths or lies. Of course, I heard somebody say one time, a half truth is a whole lie. And sometimes we lie by withholding information that's critical. It's so important that we're truthful. Now, guys, I know, I know it's a challenge when your wife asks you, how do I look? And I, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I love the way my wife looks no matter what she wears. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to lie. I'm not trying to build her anything because I love her. Even when she's frumpy and just wearing her pajamas and she's, you know, her hair's all over the place. In her own way at that moment, I think, how cute, you know? I mean, it's the same thing we say when the baby first comes out, even though it looks like a wet St. Bernard, we say, oh, how pretty, <laughs> how beautiful that baby is, right? And, we, and deep down, we're seeing the beauty, we're, seeing, we're looking beyond that, all that other thing, and we're seeing the beauty. But at the same time, and my wife will tell you that if I don't like something, I'm going to be or try to be as honest as I possibly can. And there was the other, and she'll tell you the other day, she had this dress, she says, what do you think? I says, can I be completely honest? And I'm really risking everything when I say that. <laughs> You're beautiful, but I don't like that color on you. I mean, when she picked out the wedding, the, the mother of the bride dress, she picked out two, I loved them both. Beautiful. They were both beautiful on her, but I like one a little bit better than the other. And she still picked the other one. <laughs> but she still looked beautiful. The, the point is, is, I mean, guys, you can lovingly, any of us can lovingly be honest. Because you, you'll discover if you're not honest, it's eventually going to come back and bite you in the behind. Be a person that's honest. Be a person that can be trusted. And Sometimes you have to take the heat for being honest. And the reason why sometimes we're not honest is because we don't want to take the heat that comes along with that honesty. But Jesus says, be careful with your words because when you're loose with your words or you exaggerate and make things sound more problematic than they really are, You'll begin to receive a reputation. You'll begin to be called a person like, what's the term they use today? Karen. Or if it's a guy, it's what? What's the word? Todd? I don't know. I'm not, if you're a Todd or a Karen, I'm not picking on your name. I'm just saying these are terms that people use. Oh, she's being a Karen. Oh, she, he's being a Todd. Or whatever the, the term is. I don't know. He's, I'll just, I'll be getting myself. He was being a Hilton. You know, all right. 
get myself in, out, out of trouble. But anyway, but be, being, co, co, don't y'all go using that. If some guy's over dramatic, they'll say, well, you don't be a Hilton. Don't, please don't use that. <laughs> but you know what I mean? There, there are people that have a certain reputation. Now, how many of you have, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, how many are on uh, community Facebook pages in your community? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's just like, you know, they got that one person that just seems to want to report everything that happens in the community. Anyway, but, if, but you end, look, the, my point is this, you end up getting a reputation of being an exaggerator or being someone who just kind of presents problems as not really a problem to make it big and make a mountain out of a molehill. And, and, and it's just, and when you start having that kind of reputation, people can't trust you. They can't trust you. I'm not trying to be flippant about it. I'm just trying to get you to understand. They can't trust you if you have that kind of reaction to everything that happens to you. So make sure you're truthful with the details. I know sometimes there is a temptation to make it sound more dramatic than it really is, but please don't be a drama queen and a drama king. Be truthful. Don't be flippant with your words because they can come back and hurt you. And, and, and listen, if people are not talking to you and venting to you about their problems, their worries, they're not bringing prayer concerns to you, why is that? Are you the kind of person that people can trust that people can come to, that you know they're going to keep it to themselves, you know they're going to pray for you and they really mean it? Or, or, do you have people like that in your life? Do you, do you, are you that person? Number three, be committed to the truth to maintain your credibility. Be committed to the truth. If you tell partial truths or withhold the truth, you'll be found out and you'll lose your credibility. The, folks, the Bible actually tells us that when you're not honest, that's the opposite of love. He says that, yeah, love, in 1 Corinthians 13, when he gave us that list, remember, love is patient, love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable, it's not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Aha. Uh -huh. Before we can be, before we can really express true love, we have to be truthful. And if you're going to be trusted by the ones you love, you have to be truthful. Now, sometimes truth hurts. I get it. But when you speak the truth in love, it sets people free. This has happened to me so much in my life with people who I thought I could trust. And it may, I'll be honest with you, because I've been burnt so many times, it's hard for me. I, I struggle with this. It's hard for me to trust people. As a pastor, there's sometimes it's a different dynamic because there are certain people that if I vent to wouldn't understand where I'm coming from. And there are certain people in my life in the past that I have vented to that's done a fantastic job of keeping that to themselves and praying with me and actually understanding. My dad was one of the best of the best. My dad should have had the t-shirts for pastors that has been there, done that, now what? I mean, just, he should have been the one to say, hey, I've been there, I've done it all. I've got the t-shirt to prove it. Because that, everything I threw at dad, everything I told him to pray about, he's been there. Maybe in different circumstances, but in essence, he's been there. And I miss that because I know if there's anybody in the world I could trust, it was dad with anything. There were people in my life that were toxic and harmful and hurtful. And dad prayed for them every day. 
And God got rid of them out of my life and praise God for that. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just trying to say there are certain people that come in your life that it's okay to go because they do nothing but cause a a toxic, unhealthy atmosphere. But then there have been people in the past that I've, I've trusted and I wish I hadn't trusted because they end up, I don't know the way of putting this, but they turned. You know what I'm saying? Just completely turn about face, went a different direction with no explanation as to why they said and did what they said and did. Praise God, this very sweet couple years ago, um, and they don't mind me telling you this. I'm not going to tell you who, but they won't mind me saying this. They said and did some very hurtful things. And years later, they invited me to lunch, went to lunch, sat down in front of them, and they both apologized and said, Pastor Hilton, I'm so sorry. That meant so much to me because it rekindled a relationship that I didn't have for years. But still, what happens, even though you can forgive and move forward, once you use those words that are hurtful, it's like a bullet. You can't call it back. So be careful with what you say. Be careful how you say it. Be careful with your words. Because if you're deceitful in any way, the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Be sure. When you're not honest with people, you eventually will be found out. So my question remains today, this truth. Do you really love the people you say you love? The message is clear. Earn that love. I've had a lot of people to tell me over the years, Pastor, I love you. And I know to this day, they do. But there's also been a lot of people when it's just been words because action speaks a whole lot louder than words. Amen? Are y'all with me? Y'all with me? Amen? You feel loved by people because you know you can talk to them about anything. I love the fact, listen, there are times, there are certain things that I can't talk to anybody about but Amy. Praise God, God's given me a helpmate that I can vent to sometimes and I can talk to sometimes and she can do the same to me. And Amy will tell me sometimes, she's Hilton, I'm, I'm talking to you as your wife. Do not say anything to this person. I just want you to know how I feel. Yes, ma'am. And she's right. Our marriage needs to be based on trust with any information that pops in our heads. And and, and one of the things I love about it is having somebody you can vent to and, and, and it doesn't create any harm. Later on, you can go back and say, you know, I wasn't thinking clearly when I said that. And they're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and then they lovingly are okay with it and you're able to move forward. I, I love having relationships like that. And it's just such a, such a beautiful thing. And if you have at least one person in your life like that, praise God. Praise God. So the question remains, what do you need to tell someone today? And what do you need to confess? Some of you today perhaps are withholding something that you need to share with somebody that you know would be helpful. It needs to be said. 
You may need to pray, God, help me as I share this, that I share this in such a way that they know that what I'm sharing is love. But you need to share it. You need to present it. You need to say what you need to say. You need to confess what you need to confess. If you have said something harmful about somebody behind their back, you need to confess it. Oh, Hilton, oh, whew. you didn't stop preaching. Going to meddling. Uh-uh, Hilton, Mm-mm. not doing that. Why not? Why not? Why not confess the harm you brought someone with your words? And the Bible tells us as if we, and he actually tells us, even though we confess our sins specifically to God, the Father, if we've hurt somebody and they know we've hurt them, confess them, say, I'm sorry, I hurt you. I'm sorry, I hurt you with those words. We need to get better at apologizing to one another, folks. And maybe that person hurt you and don't know they hurt you. It's okay to say, hey, you hurt me. Give them an opportunity to say, I'm sorry. Who have you been withholding the truth from? Do your friends, family, and regular acquaintances know about your faith? Do people in your life know about your faith? I mean, I understand that, no, Tom, you know, it's not, not just some stranger. I'm talking about the people you see every week. Or even every day, do they know about your faith? Because if they don't, then you're withholding some truth about you. Folks, your faith is not a private thing. In fact, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, it doesn't sound private at all, does it? There's nothing private about your faith in Jesus. Your faith in Jesus is personal, but it's certainly not private. So stop withholding your faith in the gospel. Today's the day that we need to do business with God. Be the person people can trust. Be the person people can trust. Can they trust you? Can they trust you? If people aren't coming to you with concerns or prayer requests or, or whatever, ask yourself, why is that? And pray, God, help me to be approachable. Help me to be trustworthy. I pray, God, that people that you'll, God, that you'll help me to build a reputation that people will know they can trust me to pray for them. That when you say you're going to pray for them, you're really going to pray for them. You're not just going to say, praying for you, thoughts and prayers. You're actually going to actually pray. And let, let me tell you this too, this is so important. Sometimes I know it don't always work out with circumstances, but listen, when somebody asks you to pray, don't say, I got you, I'll pray for you. And they just walk away. Pray for them right then and there and continue to pray because if you'll do it right then and there, then you'll remember later on to do the same. Don't post on Facebook or social media praying for you unless you're really going to pray. Right? Otherwise, just words. Don't be that person. Really pray. Listen. God gave us two ears and one mouth, which means he wants us to listen more than speak. Folks, God gave us ears to listen to people's problems, people's difficulties, people's burdens. And unless they tell you otherwise, it shouldn't go any further than your ears. Be trustworthy with what they're sharing and lovingly pray for them. When somebody wants to Share something that's destructive in the background. You know, Pastor Hilton, you know, when the other day when he said this, I think he was just being a jerk. And then you're telling you, yeah, he is a jerk. I don't like him either. That's, how does that help? Right? 
lot of times people, I think, I think you should have the reputation. If somebody comes to you and say, I don't like so-and-so, or that person made me mad, or I'm sick of that person, they start sharing something that, that's kind of like really negative about a person. Have the reputation of being a person that if they do that, you're going to say, okay, let's go talk to them. Come on, I'll go with you. Come on, come on. Come on. What do you mean you're not coming? Be that person. As one little boy says, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. Right? Be one who chooses your words wisely because if you don't listen, I know, I know, because I've messed up here on a few occasions, I know that if you are not careful with your words, it will come back and bite you in the backside before you know it. Be a person people can trust. And that's what I'm challenging you to do today. I, I, just stand up with me. Just stand up with me. We're getting ready to sing in just a second. But would you bow your head just for a moment? Just bow your heads. Listen, I, I know you can pray right where you're standing. I, I, I get that, and I encourage you to do that if you feel that's like what you need to do. That's okay. But there's something special about being at this altar. There's something special about taking these things to God and says, God, in the seriousness of that moment, I approach you, and God, I just pray that you'll help me to be a person people can trust. Help me to be a person that when words come out of my mouth, it will build up rather than tear down. Is that your prayer today? It's mine. Would you pray with me? Would you make that commitment with me today? This altar's open.